I've heard a lot of adjectives to describe our next speaker. <laughs> Words I've never even heard of before. <laughs> and I know I was and talking to a lot of you have been on the receiving end of his his conversations. It's not a conversation you have with him. It's just his conversation he has with you. Uh, certain words that come to mind, torment, things like that. You know, I'm always amazed that God, we are just talking how beautiful heaven is going to be, that he can work things out, that we can get there with Terry and we'd still be happy. <laughs> He's a what an amazing God we serve. <laughs> I tease Terry, we all tease Terry a lot. He was our guest last night. He's certainly, actually, he's a very pleasant person. Uh, again, as long as you are having interest in his stories, and don't have any to tell. <laughs> we actually had a good time last night. Uh, and he's uh, such a good sport about it. I, I appreciate that so much in him. As he, he was introduced earlier this morning, so most of you are aware uh, of Terry and his background, certainly. Uh, uh, he's uh, going to bring us a lesson today on the emergence of the Catholicism from the apostate church. And I'm sure that's going to be a very instructive and informative lesson. So, Terry, would you please come up and speak to us? It's a little boy, uh, not accustomed. Uh, to seeing a priest in his work uniform, as they sometimes refer to it, he went up to the priest and he asked, he said, why do you dress so funny? And the priest replied, this is the uniform that I wear when I work. And the child, still staring at him, says, do you have a boo-boo? Do you have an owie? And the priest was somewhat puzzled and he quickly figured out that the child was looking, you know, at his uh, white and black Roman collar that he had around his neck and the priest pulled out the white plastic insert just on account of the spur of the moment he just pulled whipped that out pulled it out and he showed it to the child and telling him that it was a you know also a part of his uniform and on the back side of the plastic collar uh, there this uh, you know the white white plastic insert there was some writing on it and it said wash with warm soapy water and the, the priest uh, showed this to the little boy, and then he asked him, do you know what these words say? And the little boy, obviously much too young to actually be able to read, he, he stated, I sure do. You know, what this, you know what this is saying? I sure do. And the priest was a little taken, a little taken aback, uh, and then he replied, well, okay, son, tell me what it says. And the little boy then replied, kills fleas and ticks for up to six months. <laughs> well, we laugh at some of these things, but, you know, clerical garb is not the only thing which the Roman Catholic Church, unfortunately, and we have many friends usually that are Roman Catholics. Don't you have some? Don't you know some? Don't you work with some? Uh, but. It's not just clerical garb that Jesus and others uh, really forbid uh, in Scripture. Of, uh, sh dressing in a certain manner to try to demonstrate, you know, your religiosity like the Jews who, of course, place Scriptures in a little box and tie it around uh, their neck. Or they would what? Did Jesus not refer, and others perhaps, at least by application, uh, to uh, the enlarging of the borders of your garment? You say anything? Is there a principle you think involved in that that we need to make application to our present day, you know, concerning? I think so. But you might say, well, those things are minor, but it's not minor because it demonstrates basically, you know, a, a whole different mindset than what the scriptures actually uh, teach about what the church should be. The Roman Catholic Church likes to present itself as, quote, the mother church, end quote. We dealt with that somewhat uh, during the last session. I think you can see it's not the, quote, mother church, end quote, of, of the Bible. One needs to go back, of course, and make a, a thorough examination of the Bible and church history in order to see the truth. And in so doing, uh, one will learn that the Roman church is not even the apostate church, only that she is the oldest of denominations on record 
having formed herself, like we showed in the last session, at least that I had, uh, out of the apostasy of the true Church of Christ. I'm going to go ahead, as much as I have to do this reluctantly, and I'm going to give David Brown credit for that sentence. It's an excellent sentence, and it's because it's the truth. Whenever one changes the gospel plan of salvation, uh, as to basic obedience uh, to, in, to belief in, in biblical authority, as over against, don't you see, the, uh, the alleged ecclesiastical or papal authority, uh, or on really uh, in any of these matters about repentance or confession of Christ, or perhaps especially in baptism, then a group's membership is no longer merely apostate Christians when they get the, especially the baptism part obviously wrong, they are not members of Christ's church at all. They simply are not because they have not obeyed the true biblical New Testament plan of salvation that's in this book that I hold here in my right hand. <clears throat> Yet this particular group foolishly attempts to claim that, quote, the, the, say the Catholic Church is the one true church established by Jesus Christ for the salvation of all mankind. Do you believe that or you don't? Do you believe it? Where does the Bible teach that they are? Uh, as if one can actually find the Roman Catholic Church from Matthew through Revelation. We often point out, I think someone in this lectureship already has, uh, that you know it's not it shouldn't be uh, the Roman Catholic Church. It really ought to be the Jerusalem Church of the New Testament, you see. But wrong location. Uh, a lot of wrong things. And again, we say this, in kindness and in love, but firmly that we should speak up about these matters when people make uh, either by uh, explicit statements, they make these bold claims about this uh, uh, group that really is a human denomination right along with the rest of them instead of being the, quote, mother church, or at least we ought to have our blood pressure maybe rise just a little bit, shouldn't we, when people even by implication imply that the Roman Catholic Church is the church of the Bible, the church of the New Testament. Brethren, we need to speak up on some of these things. I know you have to be careful when you're at a secular job, uh, but yet upon occasion, I think even in that situation, we ought to be bold enough to defend the gospel and defend the truth and to point out to people they are simply mistaken and then perhaps try to set up a study. We're not being paid in a secular job, I realize, to be preachers. But you know, you're a Christian everywhere you are. And I think thinking back as a young person even, I know we have a number of young people here, uh, sometimes I just didn't say, did not say anything. And I had all kinds of excuses as to why I did not speak up to some of my teenage uh, friends and so forth. But I, looking, I look back on it now and I realize I was actually uh, falling down and in a sense refusing, uh, falling down on the job, refusing to truly confess Christ because I was failing to stand up for his one, uh, uh, say, blood-bought institution uh, that we have written on the pages right here. And out I could think up ways to get out of it. This is the wrong time. This is that. And when really, sometimes I could have defended the truth, but I did not. And I look at passages now where Paul tells us to be a, not only a soldier, but he tells us to be what kind of a soldier? A good soldier, you see, of Jesus Christ. Are you? I just challenge you with that and that we ought to be bold enough and be kind and loving and, and with grace seasoned with salt that we may know how to answer each one. Uh, that means there is an appropriate timing and a lot of things and factors involved. But I still, being honest about it, I believe that I, as to put it bluntly, I wimped out in a situation where I should have spoken up. What about you? I hope you will uh, speak up, and I uh, hope that I will also be brave enough and have courage enough to do that. Uh, this group does claim to be the one true church established by Jesus Christ for the salvation of all mankind, but you cannot find it. I challenge you, and any of you listening to me on the Internet, I challenge you again to go to the Bible and, and, and prove uh, that kind of, uh, of claim uh, from uh, the New Testament's pages. You know, we have to say that some Roman Catholicism is somewhat commendable, at least in certain generic ways. 
For example, socially, the church has consistently maintained a high view of the sanctity of life, and despite upholding annulment uh, of marriage, they've held a good, solid view of marriage, no divorce, and like that. Uh, biblically, it has continued to defend the inerrancy of Scripture, at least officially, uh, at least as an official doctrine of the church, but theologically, it accepts the, uh, the true view of the Trinity, they still maintain that, uh, Christ's deity and his atonement spiritually, despite certain valid criticisms that can be made, uh, the Roman Catholic Church has basically a good understanding of the seriousness of sin and its consequences in eternal judgment. But many Roman Catholics have been willing to do what many of our own ignorant and or chicken-hearted brethren are refused to do, namely, boldly maintaining the necessity in other words, the primary purpose, the necessity of baptism for salvation, bravely upholding the exclusive nature of Christ's church and gallantly fighting abortion, both public and privately. You know any gospel preachers that won't stand for the truth in those areas? I do. Uh, ones like Max Lucado have actually been critical of us and teaching, you know, we're, that we're teaching really a meritorious, uh, work, sal meritorious work salvation. But you know, I know that I've noticed that he goes on and chums around and fellowships Roman Catholic priests and, and will speak at Roman Catholic churches and so on. I will too, but it won't be Max Licato's speech that I'd be giving there. How about you? Uh, yeah, there, well, there you go. It's the fact is he, he will be critical about the doctrines with this, about us holding a meritorious thing, when the Roman Catholic Church actually does teach it, and he's as quiet as a church mouse. He won't say anything about it. It seems to me to be a little uh, selective there. What do you think? And yet, of course, he is a well-known uh, author and known around the world, really, but especially here in America, and has written many, many uh, books. Well, again, I just cite that to show the inconsistency that you'll get involved with sometimes if you're involved with a, with a, a leftist type, uh, left-leaning, you know, type of mentality and thinking. Well, I just went ahead then and said in the manuscript that nevertheless, this does not mean even though Roman Catholics do some things right uh, and some things our own brethren, especially liberals, will not do, uh, this does not mean that this denomination or any other should even exist. As, as with all other groups that have been invented or thought up by man, uh, her unwillingness to accept biblical authority alone as the final and uh, determiner of Christian doctrine and practice disqualifies the millions making up the membership from having the approval of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's from such verses as Colossians 3 and verse 17. In 1 Corinthians 4, 6, it, Paul said you might learn in us not to go beyond the things which are written. Uh, and John 14, 15, certainly 2 John 9 through 11, whosoever goeth onward abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of the same is both the Father and the Son. We're not even to bid Godspeed, John says, to people who do not bring this doctrine, which we pointed out in my last speech of this, the truth, this definite positive doctrine that is set out uh, in the, actually in your Bible in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus would tell the leaders, I think, if he were present today, he would tell the leaders and members of this particular religious body, he would say, if you look at Mark chapter 7, and you can follow along in the book if you want, but it said, but in vain do they worship me, teaching as their doctrines, what? The precepts of men. Ye leave the commandment of God and hold fast the traditions of men. Full well do ye reject the commandment of God, Jesus said. It's so plain here. He said that ye may what? Keep your tradition, making void, he goes on to say, the word of God by your tradition. So it's not just a little innocent thing here that's involved in this, but a tremendous biblical principle. Uh, he says, which ye have delivered, and many such like things ye do. Well, that's in Mark 7, verses 7, 8, and 9, and then in verse 13. Catholic doctrines are a result of the acceptance of Roman Catholic tra tradition as effectually as a means of divine revelation on par with this book, on par with the Bible, 
so that it is not so much, as one man said, a matter of denial of the truth, but rather such an addition to the truth that it eventually becomes a departure from it. The development of many erroneous doctrines of the Roman Catholic denomination were not the result of immediate changes, but rather was a slow process over many centuries. You might look a little later in the chapter, if you have it, and you will see there a chart. I think they're trying to put that, uh, some of the charts I've used uh, on the screen, perhaps. And there is a chart, of course, showing, uh, I believe it's on page 50 in your book, uh, Roman Catholic departures from the apostolic way. And uh, this has been somewhat adapted, uh, but yet it lays it out pretty well, at least giving approximate dates of the things that they are involved in. Prayers for the dead, making the sign of the cross, uh, wax candles, uh, uh, veneration of angels and dead saints and the use of images, uh, the so-called mass as a daily celebration, uh, beginning of the exaltation of Mary, the term mother of God first applied to her at the council of Ephesus. The priest began to dress differently from so-called laymen, making a distinction between clergy and laity and so forth. Some of that by, you know, dress and wearing the collar that I uh, referred to a moment ago. And on and on it goes. I don't have time to read all that in the years that approximately that those things uh, came to be. Uh, of course, we've uh, normally pointed out uh, that it wasn't until the 600s that instrumental music, mechanical instrumental music, more precisely, was introduced but opposed at the time that it came in. Uh, but a lot of things there we don't have time to go through, but I hope that you'll study that and read that, giving, uh, that noticing that it is approximate dates. Well, uh, what we really see is the Roman Catholic uh, uh, rootstock, we'll call it. Guess what it was? Well, if you think about my last speech, it's our own first century brethren, like David Brown said. Uh, the rootstock is our own first century brethren and the apostasy that they got involved in that then led on in to finally the Roman Catholic full-blown uh, denomination over a period uh, of years. And though Jesus and various passages and others spoke of future rebellions, and we gave some of that last time I spoke, uh, which certainly in principle include all the denominations, the fact that many of our first century brethren rebelled against or abandoned the truth in fulfillment of such predictive prophecies concerning a falling away, uh, as per 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. Uh, the, in fact, we read in Scripture, the Hebrew writer even urged the first century brothers and sisters to daily personal caution. In Hebrews 3, verses 12 and 13, the Hebrew writer said this, Take heed, brethren, lest happily there shall be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief in falling away from the living God. Notice that. In what? Falling away from the living God. You do that by going away from what his word actually authorizes and teaches that we are to do, that we are to teach, that we are to preach. He said, but exhort one another day by day so long as it is called today, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, verse 13. If individuals can fall away, then it's certain that whole groups of people can fall. And Peter used the history of the Israelites to boldly predict what was about to happen to a once united first century brotherhood by saying this. And I hope you'll turn with your, in your Bible to this. If you don't look at any other verse, I want you to at least see this one and one more uh, this afternoon. In 2 Peter 2, beginning at verse 1, Here's how it reads from Peter's pen. Of course, we might say the so-called first what? Pope? <laughs> yeah. Uh, say not hardly. Uh, and, and notice he says, though, but there arose false prophets also among the, and he's referring to the Jewish people in the past, and he's, uh, as among you also there shall be false teachers. We shouldn't be shocked about it. And then notice what he says very carefully. He says, who shall privily, who shall, it's America's standard rendering, who shall privily bring in destructive heresies. The American standard footnote says, sex, S-E-C-T-S, of perdition. Sectarians, in other words, uh, of perdition. They, in other words, really, they're hell bound because this is where it came from. So denying even the master that bought, bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And he then says, and many shall follow their lascivious doings, 
by reason whom the way of the truth shall be evil spoken of, and in covetous, covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. I've run into some Christians, even some groups of them, occasionally, who do not seem to recognize the truth of what Peter has said here in 2 Peter 2, especially there in the first part of it. And where he says, uh, as among the Jewish people, there were false teachers who arose. Uh, he said, it's going to happen here under Christianity, during the Christian dispensation or age. There shall be, he says, false teachers. And then he says, shall be who shall privily shall bring in destructive heresies. Uh, well, do you know what he's talking about when he says privily? You could just say, in some translations will say, or com commentaries, privately. Uh, some translate it. I have a little list here. He says, uh, some say cunningly. Uh, one version says, and it's very accurate, I think, basically the idea, they will import disastrous heresies. Notice how they do it? They import it. It's not from God. It's not from the Scripture. It's not authorized uh, in the Bible by direct statement, by implication, or a uh, positive or negative example. Oh, no. Another translation says they secretly introduce, now notice what they introduce, ruinous divisions, uh, secretly bring in destructive heresies. That's the ESV and also another version. Uh, one translation says, who will smuggle in pernicious heresies. That's from a Catholic Bible, by the way, the New American Bible. Good translation there. They will secretly, another version says, they will secretly teach things that are wrong, teaching that will cause people to be lost. Maybe that's the simplest one, isn't it? Teaching things what? That are wrong. They're error. And it's serious error, or he wouldn't call it ruinous division or disastrous heresies and all the other things that he says. The American standards say shall bring in destructive heresies. Well, one says they will cleverly tell their lies. Well, again, we try to be kind here, but, you know, that principle did apply to those that he's talking about in the first century when the Roman Catholic Church was not even there. But certainly, by principle, it applies to them and any uh, group that would, in a sense, fulfill it of bringing in privily, privately, cunningly, secretly, smuggling it in, and all the other words that we use there. But, you know, when I run into people, sometimes even a, a group of people, they seem to think that a false teacher will show up, and he will do things like this. He will show up and march around, and he's going to come into a congregation with a sign that says this. I'm a false teacher. You get it? I'm a, hey, I'm a false teacher. You see me up here? I, I'm a false teacher. And not only that, am I a false teacher? Apparently, brethren, looking for this kind of thing. But they think that he's going to show up with a sign or banner like this, you know, and, and place it, stake it in the ground there in front of everybody, and then he's going to pull out a list like this and says, and here's the things that I teach false. Here they are. Here they are. Got it? Is that what you're looking for? Oh, come on. Come on. But some brethren are so easily duped because they know so little Bible. I hate to say it, but some of my brethren know about as much Bible as you could hold in a thimble. Uh, it's really that pitiful a situation. Are they going to do this? They're not going to do that and have a placard here. It's like uh, the writer Peter said here, and he's speaking by inspiration. He knows what he's talking about. And he said, there, but there arose false prophets among the Jewish people. We've got a past situation of examples and specifics of it, in fact, in the Old Testament. As among you also, there shall be false teachers who shall privily bring in destructive heresies. They're cunning with this. They are tricky with it. Uh, they can do it in all sorts of cunning secretly, uh, cunningly. Remember those words? Who will smuggle in pernicious heresies. They don't go around, you know, playing a trombone and having a band with banners and a list of the things they teach false. You've got to know the Bible, and I've got to know the Bible well enough to see that what they're doing is teaching that is false, however subtle or openly they may be, you know, boldly proclaiming. And, and folks, do we really understand 
uh, what the Bible teaches. If we didn't have anything else, and this is the other verse, if you don't get any other verse, I hope you go home and you think about this, the second Peter chapter 2, uh, beginning there at verse 1. But I want you to turn in your New Testament now to such a plain verse. I don't even know that I put this in the chapter, but it may have come to me a little later after I turned it in. But I want you to look at Matthew. I certainly thought about it. Matthew 7 and verse 15. Here's what our Lord said about it. He said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. They come to you how? In sheep's clothing. They don't show up, and, and with the placards and the list here is one way of saying it. Another is to use Jesus' statements here. They don't show up and look like this. They, isn't he cute? He's so nice. And I hear some of my brethren, and they'll brag about some of the most vicious fault teachers that some of us have ever had any dealings with. These people will eat you up. You know why? It's like what Jesus said here. Look at it. Read it again. Look at it one more time. Look at it. Uh, beware of false prophets. That's a warning. That's a warning to young people. That's a warning to middle-aged people. That's a warning to, it doesn't matter how old you get, Satan will work through people like this from other verses implying and teaching this. He says, beware of false prophets, false teachers, in other words. He says, who come to you, how? In sheep's clothing. But inwardly, what are they really? But inwardly, what are they? He tells you. He tells you what they are. They look like sheep on the outside. They look just like sheep, you see, on uh, the outside. But when all is said, when all is said and done, and you really find out here what they are, this is what they really are. You thought puppetry was dead in the church? <laughs> look at him. He, he's looking you over. And you know what a real one would do when he's looking you over up in Alaska or someplace? Or even maybe out west? Yellowstone? Hey, I want more than just a piece of cloth of a tent between me and some of these deals. Don't you? I mean, think about that. Oh, but how does he appear? <laughs> Jesus is telling us exactly how this happens. And are we smart enough to be able to understand what Jesus said? They appear outwardly like this. So gentle, so soft, so loving. Uh, I've never met any of them except they will describe themselves as loving liberals or whatever you want to call them. Uh, but the fact is, they won't refer to themselves for what they really are. But Jesus is, and he says, this is what you have inside. They are not this, and we must see uh, what they really are. Now let's ask a third point here before we leave this, and that is, uh, why... Why get mad at a person who demonstrates that this is what that really is? Some brethren get mad at it when you show and say, hey, here's what it really is. Here's the evidence. Here's the proof. This is what's really in there and what you got. Not just this little sheep here, see? And when you show that to them, what do they do? Oh, they get angry at the person who's showing this to them. Hey, that's your best friend who's showing you that in reality, isn't it? Jesus said it is. Jesus implied that that's the case. And he repeatedly did it, by the way, in all of his altercations and back and forth with the various people he came in uh, contact with. What about the woman at the well? You notice how he very deftly kind of worked the situation around in which he ends up uh, saying to her, go and call thy husband and come hither. How do you think she felt? Uh, you know how she felt. I have no husband. I'm just here saying that. I have no husband. Yeah, you've had X number of husbands, and now the one you're, in essence, he's implying, shacking with is not your husband. Who was her best friend at that very moment in time? Jesus Christ was, because he told her about her spiritual condition. Any person that shows you from the Bible, from God's word, certainly he was teaching God's word, because he's God's son. Uh, and he's inspired, of course, uh, but we have to use this, but we can still determine the truth and then make application and show someone the reality of a situation, and you ought to thank someone. 
about that and say, thank you for showing me this wolf in sheep's clothing for what it really is and what the situation really is. So don't get mad. Thank the person. Shake their hand. And it'll be easy when you shake my hand here today, but shake their hand and say, thank you, brother. Thank you, sister, for showing me my, the error of my way. Because error is not going to take you through. You see, we must have the truth is what makes us, of course, free. Well, again, I must go on here, but, but I hope you always will remember that concerning uh, for 2 Peter 2, verse 1, and about who shall privily bring in destructive heresies. They do it cunningly. They do it in a foxy, tricky way. I guess I should say wolfy instead of foxy. They do it sneakily, you see. They don't go with banners like this. If that, that's what some members of the church are apparently looking for. They don't see that a person can uh, creep in and end up then uh, dividing a congregation with their false doctrine uh, until it's too late. And that ought not to be because Jesus, Peter, and others like Paul warned us of that thing. Paul, of course, said to mark those that are causing uh, divisions and occasions of stumbling contrary to what? To the doctrine which ye learn. Notice it's the. Yeah, you can circle that at least in your mind again like we did in my last session. Well, again, we know that who, who fell away? Bob went and lists some of the New Testament believers who fell away before the Roman Catholic Church even came into some sort of formal existence. Though here we surely find the seeds of Romanism, which eventually evolved from such. such who fell away? I'll tell you. I won't bother to give all the verses here, but it's listed in the book uh, in Acts 5. Ananias and Sapphira fell away by their personal behavior. Uh, the man who had his father's wife in the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 5. Uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander. Notice some name calling going on here by Paul. The Judaizing teachers corrupted their own faith and sought to pollute the faith of the Gentile saints by following what? The law of Moses instead of the gospel of Christ. And some taught the resurrection is past already. You know, in recent years, you uh, preaching, brethren, and elders ought to know, and I'm sure you do, that, that, that some others have arisen in recent years saying, it's already passed, the resurrection's over. Uh, and, and, and some people refuse to be warned about these things, even when it comes back around again. Uh, it's happened in the first century, and then it's happened in our lifetime. Some were teaching there'd be no resurrection at all. There were Gnostics who taught some rather despicable doctrines, and we've given some information, you know, uh, about that. Uh, Geisler, uh, Norman Geisler, observes the fact that the seeds of the, an Episcopal form of government were found in New Testament times when John the Apostle spoke of it in his third epistle, and he warned it and said it this way. He said, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us, 3 John 9. That's the New King James rendering. Uh, thus, even an incipient uh, primacy practice is implicit in 3 John. Geisler can see that. Surely the rest of us as New Testament, actual New Testament Christians should see it. And also in Matthew 20, verses 20 and 21, there came to him the mother of the sons of Zebedee with her sons worshiping him and asking a certain thing of him. What'd she ask about? Uh, and he said unto her, what wouldest thou? What do you want me to do for you? What's the problem? Tell me what's going on. She saith unto him, Command that these my two sons may sit, one on thy right hand and one on thy left hand, in thy kingdom. Boy, there, you don't see it? Seeds of some Roman uh, Catholic doctrine? To say that Roman Catholic pontiffs over the centuries have loved to have the preeminence among them and have desired positions of power as Christ alleged vicar on earth is truly an understatement. But we were warned about it. Winton goes on to cite the departures of Marcion and, and Montanus and others of the, of the development of a separate priesthood and clergy laity system, the teaching of the doctrine, false doctrine of original sin, infant baptism, or what they call baptism, sprinkling or pouring for baptism, creeds, mechanical, instrumental music and worship, Lord, changes in the Lord's Supper, and papal uh, authority. And he also specifies departures in the organization of the church which developed over the years to resemble the chain of command that used, uh, by the, was used by the Roman Empire. And the seriousness with which faithful brethren have correctly, at least in the past, viewed this, 
Uh, and I would refer you to the Jewel Miller, Jewel Miller film strips about that uh, and, the, and the, some charts involved in that that we've used so effectively, and they're true still. Such precedent-setting apostasy will explain why a recent tragic division occurred among brethren over such things as Dave Miller's uh, and the Brown Trail Church's unauthorized reevaluation and reaffirmation scheme regarding the eldership. And I refer you to see Michael Hasher's chapter, and we give you the footnote as to what volume that's found in. Such departures as these eventually led to the establishment of the same nature, in other words, uh, led to the establishment of the Roman Catholic Church so that the apostasy was now complete, leading to the formation of the, of, uh, the myriad deno of denominations making up our present world. And yet, you know, if it, and if it was still true, and I used to show those all the time, still will, the Jewel Miller film strips, usually I show number five, the history of the Lord's Church, I show that number four, and then I show number four last. I think that's the proper order you ought to use it. But in those film strips, we make the point that one of the very first uh, evidences of apostasy occurred where? Concerning the authority and about a bishop being over a leading elder in one church and then finally throwing his mantle over one, two churches, three churches, and right on up the line. And we say, can't allow that. Even though it's an incipient form, a tiny form of it as it starts, it gradually will evolve into a full-fledged monster of false doctrine, and yet some of our brethren wonder why some of us get upset when we hear that some faithful elders have been ousted by this ridiculous and false re-evaluation and reaffirmation process of the eldership. I asked recently an individual uh, at the Get Well Church of Christ in Memphis, Tennessee, I said, are you, any of you contemplating, are there elders there contemplating going through a re-evaluation, reaffirmation process? He says, no, Terry, that's not even in our thinking. That's not even on our minds at all to do something like that. And then, of course, you know what I said next. Those of you who know what's going on, then why do you have Dave Miller come speak for you and fellowship him and act like nothing happened? I don't know, I don't know, let them explain it. Any of you listening here, if you're involved in that, we'll let you explain it. Well, it simply, it simply will not uh, work. Well, again, uh, we're not saying that the Roman Catholic Church in this material is wrong about everything. They're certainly not. Uh, there's some good that they can do. Of course, they are false teachers, and that, like we point out from uh, one of Wayne Jackson's articles, which is excellent on this particular point, and he gives, lays out seven points and shows from certain passages of Scripture by Paul and so forth that the Roman, how the Roman Catholic Church certainly would fit those verses in the New Testament involving things such as the man of sin and so on. I'll let you read that. But when I thought about that in the miracle situation and then it just happened to fall into my hands, someone said that uh, the Pope and Obama, President Obama, are on the same stage in Yankee Stadium in front of a huge crowd. And I'm thinking about, you know, the claimed miracles by the Catholics, you know, the Lady of Fatima stuff and all that. Uh, uh, the, they said that the Pope and Obama are on the same stage in Yankee Stadium in front of a huge crowd. And the Pope leans towards Mr. Obama and said, do you know that with one little wave of my hand, he said, I can make every person in this crowd go wild with joy. And he said, this joy will not be a momentary display, but will go deep into their hearts and they will forever speak of this day and rejoice. And President Obama replied, he said, I seriously doubt that. With one little wave of your hand, show me. So the Pope backhanded him and knocked him off the stage. <laughs> and the crowd roared and cheered wildly, just like you would have done if you would have been there. Kind of brings a tear to your eye, doesn't it, to think about it. Well, no, they're wrong. Pope, no one else in the Catholic organization or any other denomination, and no member of the Lord's Church, not even Don Finto of Belmont, a Nashville fame, uh, even though he claimed to be an apostle. He didn't have the signs of, the, of an apostle, did he? <laughs> Which Paul said that he ought to have. Well, again, I hope that you'll read these materials of, of all of us that have written here in this book. And I'll just say, uh, if you'll read some of the things that I have printed in this book, especially from uh, Geisler and, and another person there, uh, that if only our 
apostate scholars had the intestinal fortitude to read some of at least those so-called scholarly volumes openly and honestly, and Geisler has written an excellent volume, in fact, on logic and the Bible, Come, Let Us Reason, an introduction to logical thinking, and he actually says uh, in, uh, in this volume on Rome that he and another individual did, which I footnote here, he says that something does not have to be explicitly taught in Scripture to be true. Liberals, are you listening? <laughs> are you hearing that? That's not by some old moss-backed person in the brotherhood here that doesn't know from Ned and the first reader, you know, the old narrow-minded legalist that we came out of the, the uh, Stone Campbell movement of the 1800s. No, this is from Norman Geisler. Look at how many books he's written. Look at the degrees that he has. And he says something does not have to be explicitly taught in Scripture to be true. Even other essential teachings of the faith were not explicitly taught in the technical sense of this term. The doctrine of the Trinity is a case in point. Many of us made that same point. And what happens? Derision being laughed at by liberals in Christ's church. And I say, no wonder... I, and say, well, I may say this, I've probably read all that too fast for the liberals among us. I need to go back and read it more slowly. Uh, no wonder the liberal new hermeneutic is infected with logophobia and mythology. That's the hatred and fear of logic. It goes past just being dumb about it and having a phobia about it. They actually hate it. Uh, you know, Jesus' opponents did too, didn't they? <laughs> you know why? I can't help but laugh out loud sometimes. I try to resist it and fight it. But I'll read there, it says about Jesus, it'll say something like this. They durst ask him no more questions. <laughs> Folks, there's a reason for that. He's the great logician in addition to being the great physician. Uh, but they fail to read men like Geisler, much less to recommend such cogent materials to their students in place of the marrowless claptrap, I call it, to which they apparently, their students are accustomed to have, you know, from them. I hope you'll read, I don't have time to read it this, this uh, afternoon, but I hope you'll read a concluding statement that I included in this book, and when it was not made by us old moss-backed, pharisaic members, as we're sometimes called, of a 1950s church. I hope Rubel Shelley and others will read it because he's made accusations along the same line. But you read what Geisler has said there in that uh, full paragraph or two that I have given there. Fact is, God uh, desires apostolic unity in all the churches based, Geisler says, on the doctrine of the apostles. We agree with that, don't we, brethren? As over against our new hermeneutics foolish love letter viewpoint about the letters of the New Testament, we read that Christ and this is from Geisler, commissioned the apostles to lay down the doctrinal basis that is binding on all churches everywhere. And I backed up Geisler by adding in Acts 2.42 and Ephesians 2.20. Inadvertently, Geisler and his cohort Betancourt described faithful churches of Christ, and I mean by, those, by reference to Romans 16.16, 16, the New Testament church, in saying this, and I'll close with this, Many churches deny the authority of any council, any Roman Catholic, doesn't matter what kind of council, though they agree with many things stated by them, particularly the early ones. This they do by insisting strongly that, the on, only, that only the Bible has binding authority. All creeds and confessions are man-made, thus no authority is attached to any church councils, whether they be local or or so-called universal councils. This eliminates, brethren, councils not only in Abilene, Nashville, Malibu, or Oklahoma City, and also Lubbock, but also it eliminates councils in Cookville, Austin, Denton, Sheffield, Lakeland, and yes, even Memphis, right? I know Dub agrees with that, <laughs> and, and, and David Brown. Uh, well, you read the last statement we put in there by the great Catholic theologian, and they had some brilliant persons in certain areas, certainly Aquinas, and that he believed really, as we do, that it's only insofar as these successors of the apostles, well, there are no real successors as being apostles, but have they, they have only insofar 
as they tell us those things which the apostles and prophets have left in their writings, Aquinas said. Thus, the knowledge of men is not the rule of faith, but what? God's truthfulness, to which we say, Amen. And that's exactly what, how we should look at it, and we see the Roman Catholic Church is not Christ, New Testament Church, although they claim uh, that it is simply not true. Stay with the Bible, and you'll always be in good shape with God. When you depart from this life, if you've done what, only what the Bible said, nothing more and nothing less, being a Christian, nothing more and nothing less, uh, you are in uh, good hands, the good hands of Jesus Christ. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you, Brother Terry, for that fine lesson. I know we tease you a lot, but he does have a way of putting it down on a level and laying it out logically where we all understand it. And I doubt there's even a, the young ones among the crowd here don't understand what the, sh the uh, wolf in sheep clothing means. <laughs> Although I did notice the wolf never got a word in. <laughs> but that's a good thing. Uh, we appreciate it so much. That was, that was a fine lesson. And, and uh, it was an honor to have you last night as a guest, even though I tease you about it. Uh, I appreciate that. He had Brendan and I in stitches last night. So. But we finally had to call it in. To it. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.